With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, Heard Tell Show, it is a Thursday. Uh, May the 12th year of our Lord 2022 just continues to zip right on by. Yeah, life comes at you quick. You better pay attention. It goes right past you. You don't even know it, especially on a year moving as fast as this one is. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on Herd Tell. Got a lot of stuff to do today. We're going to get right to it. Um, we have in Europe the continued fallout of Vladimir Putin's war of aggression in Ukraine, where he continues to slaughter civilians, level cities, and murder people. NATO is on the verge of getting bigger. Sweden and Finland, maybe as early as this week, uh, we have some movement over there. We have a big-name dignitary visiting both. We're going to cover some of the history of those two countries with Russia, with the old Soviet Union, and with NATO, put into perspective what might be happening, covering the news before it becomes news here on Herd Tell. Also, uh, it's election season. People that have actually been on the program are standing for election. We'll update how they did in their primary. At the end of the show, have an interesting story uh, where there's a tradition in the NFL when the new guys come in, if somebody else has the jersey number you want, you don't get it for free. You got to pay for it. And in this case, a very worthy charity got a whole lot of money for the trouble. We'll talk about that story. And we're going to have a little fun today. We're going to take a break from the politics, talk a little history. Sarah Stook is back on the program. Y'all love her because we get great feedback every time she's on. We've been talking to her about presidential history. We've talked to her about the first ladies. Today, might have to do a little bit of a parental discretion label here. The presidents love lives. Yes, presidents as husbands, as lovers, as all sorts of scoundrelous shenanigans. Uh, We're going to talk about all of it. Might not be completely appropriate for the children. We're not going to get too randy with it, as she would say in her British accent. But there's some naughty stuff down in there. We're going to talk about our president's love lives with Sarah Stuck, one of our favorite contributors that join us on the program. First, uh, we need to talk about something happening in domestic politics. Um, There's been a new aid package for Ukraine that has been passed through Congress. Um, It it tops out at $39.8 billion in aid to Ukraine. Well, let's just pause here for a second. What do we always tell you on this program? Read the bills, or at least go in and search them. They're all available. They're always available on PDF. You can pull them up. You don't have to read every bit of it. You can control F or command F if you're one of them cult of fruit apple people, and you can find the parts you want to know about in the bill, or at least read from reliable sources and good reporting on what's in the bill. Don't just react to the bill. What we're seeing a lot of is folks going, oh, well, we're sending $40 billion to Ukraine and such and such kid in such and such place in America doesn't have a fork or whatever the case may be. That's always the case. I understand the argument. And a lot of folks, especially on the right and some on the left as well, have started to decry the aid we're giving Ukraine. So when this bill passed, quite a few things happened that folks in the media are trying to make some hay out of it as, well, we're sending money there while our bridges are crumbling or our children are starving or grandma's wheelchair don't work or whatever the case may be. Look, it's a political season that is to be expected. So let's start here. What is actually in this bill? We want to, we want to turn down the noise of this bill. What is actually in it? Well, it's $39 billion, roughly 40. Let's round it off. Let's make the numbers easy. In addition to the $6 billion for security assistance to Ukraine, I'm reading from CBS News here, like training and weapons, the legislation includes almost $9 billion to replenish U.S. stocks of equipment sent to the Ukraine and $3.9 billion for mission and intelligence support. That's to get the stuff there and letting them know how to use it once it's there. And this replenishes our stores. People are talking about, well, we're sending them our supplies of pick whatever weapon or equipment you're doing. We've got to replenish those. The bill also provides, from CBS News, $2 million for technical and regulatory support to Ukraine's nuclear regulatory agency. Remember all the hubbub about Chernobyl and the other nuclear plants. The Russians started shelling them. Everybody panicked. There's money in these packages to make sure that those nuclear agencies have what they need to keep everything exactly where it needs to be. Nuclear energy is something we don't want to screw around with. That's probably worth at least $2 million, probably a lot more. 
and more than $5 billion to address food insecurity because of the conflict. Another $900 million will go towards helping Ukrainian refugees and arrivals with housing and other support. That money is not for refugees coming here. It's important to point out that's for places like Poland and the EU that are going to be taking them in. The White House hopes the aid will provide sufficient support for Ukraine through September, the end of the fiscal year. The reason that's important, of course, is because that's when all the budgeting stuff comes due, and that's when Congress will convene for the last time before the election, and then we have a new Congress coming in the January. Now, uh, the president also signed a separate bill that will allow the U.S. to lend and lease military equipment to Ukraine, an effort styled after a World War II-era program that helped defeat Nazi Germany. A lot of that equipment is basically what we would normally call cold storage. It's stuff from reserve units, old 155 howitzers, old M113 armored personnel carriers, stuff like that, that we're not using anyway. We will lend lease them to Ukraine. Why am I bringing all this up? Well, because the noise from some folks that are more isolationist and more uh, anti-war and more nationalist in their policies are getting really, really, really loud about the aid we're giving to Ukraine. So let's be really clear here. I don't like war. I don't like war as somebody who has seen war. I don't like it. I hate it. I wish it didn't exist. But I live on planet Earth in the year 2022, and I can read history. War is the commonplace. Peace is the exception, and peace is precious, which means you pick wars that are worthwhile to support and fight. We are not sending our own troops to Ukraine. That's not happening. Everybody calm down. There is no good options in Ukraine because the Ukrainian people are paying a fearful price in both lives, in territory, in destruction, and in treasure for what Russia is doing to them. The best of the least bad options for the United States of America, in my humble but accurate opinion, is for us to give the resources to Ukraine to fight their own battle here, with some very select and very purposeful support from the United States and other allies. Now, allies even closer, like Poland, are a lot more involved but they also share a border and things like this, so they have a right to be, and we will support them in what they do as an ally. But we have a little different agenda here because one, we're far away, and two is we're still the United States of America, dang it, and we're supposed to be the good guys. Putin is inevitably, and in any measure you want to take, the bad guy here. There is no version of what Ukraine did politically or NATO did politically or anybody else did anywhere else that justifies Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine leveling cities, murdering civilians, making a purposeful terror campaign against the civilian population of Ukraine to try to get them to capitulate. And it hasn't worked. They fought back. They have bravely fought back. And we have talked about on this program before that they gave lie to Putin's reasons for this war, that they didn't have an identity and they weren't a real country anyway, because now they've got a real identity. They're the Ukrainians, and they're the people that stood up to Vladimir Putin and fought back when a lot of the world preferred to cower and give him what he wanted over the better part of the last 20, 25 years. But that's beside the point to this aid package. As folks get louder and louder about our aid to Ukraine, we should ask them directly, well, what is it you support? Now, some of them have very firm principles about America not being involved overseas for any reason. They're completely isolationist. I can respect their opinion, but I disagree with them wholeheartedly. Just because you don't like a globally integrated world doesn't mean it's going to go away. And the bad guys will always find a way to find you wherever you are. We've seen this over and over again in history. We've seen this movie. We know how it ends. So when somebody's getting beat up in the street, if you're not going to jump in and fight yourself, you can at least hand them a stick and let them defend themselves a little bit better. Maybe give them some pointers. Maybe let them know somebody's coming up behind them to hit them. You do that if you were out on the street somewhere. We can do that for our friends in Ukraine. Yes, we're spending a lot of money, but let's be grown-ups here. We're spending trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars on all sorts of things. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. If you're going to pick out the $40 billion going to Ukraine and claiming that's why the bridges are collapsing and the children are starving, you're going to have a long road to hoe because we spent trillions and trillions of dollars on COVID relief and other things that we can't even keep track of for a lot more than the $40 billion that we're sending over to Ukraine. People are dying. People are under the threat of tyranny or the United States of America. If we're not going to fight alongside of them, we can at least help them. And I'm going to be very skeptical of people in Congress who use that as a political bargaining chip. You want to call me a warmonger for that? Fine, I'll wear that hat. Because the war the Ukrainians are fighting are for their homes, their families, their land, and their country. That's about as righteous as a war 
as it gets. More Hertel right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Overseas we go. Uh, NATO expansion looks like it's in the works. Finland and Sweden, there may be news on both of them in an official capacity, maybe as early as this week. Uh, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is visiting both countries, along with other NATO folks reaching out. I uh, wanted to give a little bit of background as this progresses, why this is happening. This is from the AP, part of their story and coverage of this. Um, the shocking scenes playing out in Ukraine and Russia aggression, of course, especially countries like Finland have a long history uh, with the Russians going back to the World War II days when the uh, Finns fought them to a standstill out in the woods. So there's a lot of back history here, folks. Um, from the piece, after remaining firmly against membership for decades, public opinion in both countries shifted rapidly this year. Polls show more than 70% of Finns and over 50% of Swedes now favor joining NATO. The shocking scenes playing out made Finns draw the conclusion that, quote, this could happen to us, said Charlie Salinas Postatic, a researcher at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. I'm sure I butchered that name. I apologize. During the Cold War, Finland stayed away from NATO to avoid provoking the Soviet Union, while Sweden already had a tradition of neutrality dating to the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Both countries built up robust conscription-based armed forces to counter any Soviet threats. Sweden even had a nuclear weapons program, but scrapped it in the 60s. The threat of conflict flared up again, though, in the 80s, when a Soviet submarine ran aground off the coast of southwestern Sweden. Eventually, the sub was tugged back out to sea, ending a tense standoff between Swedish forces and the Russian Soviet rescue fleet. As Russia's military power declined in the 90s, Finland kept its guard high, while Sweden considering a conflict with Russia increasingly unlikely, downsized their military and shifted its focus to territorial defense towards peacekeeping missions and faraway conflict zones. They were an ally in some of our things, like in Afghanistan, by the way. Russia's annexation of Crimea prompted the Swedes to reassess that and their security situation. They reintroduced conscription and started rebuilding defensive capabilities, including on the strategically important Baltic Sea island of Gotland. Defense analysis say... Finland and Sweden have modern and competent armed forces that would significantly boost NATO's capabilities in Northern Europe and the Baltic. Finnish and Swedish forces train so often with NATO, they are essentially interoperable already. Adding new members typically takes months, but because those decisions need to be ratified by all 30 NATO members. But in the case of Finland and Sweden, the ascension process could be done in a couple of weeks. That's a direct quote. According to NATO officials who briefed reporters on the condition, they not be identified on background because no application has been formally made yet. And these are not normal times, he concluded. That's from the AP. A little background history reporting on the news before it happens that it looks like Finland and Sweden will officially join NATO very, very soon. An announcement could come as early as within the next few days or weeks. We will continue to cover this and Vladimir Putin's war of aggression into Ukraine continues to have ripple effects of the old allies rejoining themselves to face the new old wickedness of Russia. More Hertel right after this. Welcome back to Her Tell. Okay, we're going to take a break from the news of the day and talk to one of our favorites. She is a presidential historian. We've had her on many times before. She does these wonderful uh, threads and pieces on presidential history, and we've got a good one here. Little Racy might need a little bit parental discretion, Tipper Gore, and you folks like that. The love lives of the president. Sarah Stuck, our friend from over in the UK. How are you, ma'am? 
I'm very good. Thank you for having me on again. It's always very fun to do. Fantastic. Uh, I told her if she came back on, I would dress up because she's big in the fashion. And then she busts out a T-shirt and pearls. That wasn't really fair, but that's okay. Uh, we will deal with it. She writes for the Mallard over yonder. She writes for Elections Daily here. Uh, and we love talking to her. Okay. What got you on the Love Lives of the Presidents? You've been doing this First Lady series. Was that just kind of the natural crossover like well wait a minute there's obviously relationship stuff here well somebody we tweeted about, about tweeted about rating the presidents on horniness and somebody tagged me and said this is something that you should do and I said well that's a challenge accepted so I did it I I don't know like normally if we're talking about the love life of a president or a leader in other parts of the world it usually means there's a scandal going on because you know nice safe relationships are boring we don't like talking about them but that's not really the case with the presidents. There's actually a lot of fascinating stuff, and there's a lot of relationships here that actually kind of affected the course of history in some cases, isn't it? Well, like many men, they're men. That's it's it's the power thing, you know. A lot of pe- men and probably women in power do some very naughty things because they think they can get away with it. And power is an aphrodisiac. It's the same throughout history, and it will continue to be so. So it's you know not really a surprise that there's quite a few presidents who have a bit of a sketchy sort of libido. Let's call it that. To be yeah, we got to be FCC compliant here. So we're going to be using euphemisms a lot. Just prepare yourselves. Lots of double entendres on today's hurt tell. Okay, let's start with the good news, though. Who were the good husbands? Who were the good presidents? They behave themselves. They love their wives. They raise their children, et cetera, et cetera. Let's start with the good ones, because I know everybody wants to get to the juicy stuff. But we had some very well-behaved presidents, didn't we? Well, this may be a surprise if you sort of know him well, but Andrew Jackson was an extremely, well, he wasn't unfaithful let's put it that way he did truly love Rachel he adored her but he also did get into fights whenever her um, morality was questioned because they married vigorously because she wasn't divorced from her first husband as she thought she was so she was you know slandered in the press I mean at the time that was terrible but he loved her he did truly love her he never remarried afterwards he was during the petticoat affair he took sides with the Eatons because he it was reminded of Rachel so you know he was pretty interesting and a bit horrible in some respects but his virtue was he did truly love Rachel and I think that is very nice from a president known for his temper. You put it in a humorous way that he liked his dueling pistols more than he liked women apparently. Yeah I don't, there's no evidence of any extramarital affairs or you know flings or anything I think you know he was more interested in fighting than women. All right, let's talk about our first president, George Washington, because kind of interesting for those times, he had, of course, Martha is famous. They really had, I I hate, this sounds like I'm, I'm knocking them, but I'm not. I mean, this is a compliment. They really had a business partnership, didn't they? I mean, back in those days, in the late 1700s, you didn't really marry for love. It was a bonus, you know, you would especially among the upper classes. I mean, in, in, the, in Britain and continental Europe, you know, you would still had the um, arranged marriages, which weren't really as much of a thing in America, but, you know, it was a business partnership. She was a widow. She needed someone to help raise her remaining children. He needed a leg up and she was absolutely loaded. So they thought, okay, this is a good marriage. They, they It wasn't a passionate relationship and they probably weren't in love but they loved each other. She was a very good wife. She wasn't some pampered plantation wife. She got her hands dirty. They were both, you know, very good together. And I think she was a fantastic first lady in that respect. When he was out during the Revolutionary War, she would come out with and help with the soldiers. She was sort of the perfect wife. He, he wouldn't have gone for some pampered, sort of more of a housewife kind of thing. I think he wanted somebody who would be in the trenches with him. And that's what he got with Martha. And I think that was a very perfect match for them. All right. Very controversial president when it comes to his personal relationships. I don't want to rehash the whole thing because we we all kind of know where it goes. But uh, Jefferson, uh, we know the Sally Hastings stuff. We know uh, his wife died. But there is background on that about his wife died and promises made there, isn't there? Well, she had very poor relationships with her stepmother. She had quite a few, because her mother died when she was quite young. And she said, never remarry. And Thomas Jefferson said, sure. Obviously, he sort of got around that by raping his underage slave, who was his wife's half-sister. But, you know, he didn't remarry, but 
still it's not exactly you know scandalous in this sense of extramarital affairs it's more you know very extremely morally questionable yeah you almost need a flow chart for that one don't you where it all gets entangled yeah unbelievable okay among kind of let's let's say the founding fathers the early presidents the first five or six presidents we had who else had a notable relationship either with their wife or with somebody that wasn't their wife that maybe they shouldn't have been having you know sort of up until apart from jefferson up until like jackson they had they were very you know very faithful men uh, john adams abigail adams had a nice famous loving relationship he when he was in france he was told he should have a mistress and he said now for abigail which is you know very sweet and they had a very long marriage of 50 years very much in love very intellectually matched um madison had dolly this again was a business arrangement because she was a poor widow and he needed a wife but again they cared for each other and she was a brilliant hostess um james monroe and elizabeth courtright another one john and louisa adams so yeah they were pretty morally upright faithful to the wives sort of no rumors of affairs or raping slaves so tick 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 all around there <laughs> talking to sarah stuck our presidential historian friend over in the uk uh okay here's one because he is universally known as one of the worst presidents we've ever had very good chance he may have had the worst love life of any president we ever had, James Buchanan. Well, common historical census today believes he might have been at least bisexual or homosexual. We will probably never know because that kind of thing was, well, it was illegal at the time, so he's not going to shout about it, is he? But some historians say he wasn't interested in romance. He was engaged, she did kill herself, and it's very murky of the reasons why she did that. But he didn't really seem to have a lot of interest in sex. He could have been perhaps asexual. He even wrote, if I ever marry, she'll have to understand I'm not an affectionate person. So that's pretty interesting that he had no interest in marriage and love. He even told his niece, Harriet, who was his hostess, don't marry quickly. And she waited until she was 36, which at the time was very, very late. Especially since she got a lot of proposals for being very young and pretty. Mm. And his contemporary... Uh, Franklin Pierce, he doesn't get talked about in print. By the way, it's no accident that we had a couple of our worst presidents leading up to the Civil War. Those two <laughs> things go together. Franklin Pierce is so interesting. People never talk about him. He is ranked usually as one of the most handsome presidents. But this guy's life, his personal life, not just his presidency, just tragedy on tragedy on tragedy. He, he's really an interesting case, isn't he? He was, you know, really tragic. He lost, he had several sons, three of whom died before he reached the presidency. On the way to the inauguration, there was a accident on the train and his son was basically beheaded before their eyes, the last remaining child, Benny. Jane Pierce was already very sort of mentally unstable as it was and this sort of pushed her over the edge, which you could imagine it would do to anybody's. So very sad for Jane. Franklin turned to alcohol, so he did you know, very devoted to his wife. Again, no rumors of affairs, but sad really, isn't it? You think about, can you imagine the press of something today, like the president, the president-elect's child getting killed on the way to the inauguration? That'd be the biggest story of the century. And he, and he had, he was the only casualty. There was nobody else. It was just happened to be that poor lad because he was looking out the window and it was just unfortunate position and timing. Jeez, terrible. Uh, Sarah stuck with us. Okay, this gets us to the guy that had to clean up the mess of all those bad presidents. He also had a pretty sloppy, ugly, very contentious personal life. We know Abraham Lincoln as one of the great men in history. We know him as one of our greatest presidents, if not the greatest. I have him as the greatest. A lot of other people do too. How was his love life? He was a tall man. He was a very athletic man in his youth. He had a reputation for winning fights and wrestling contests. Big strapping lad, not great looking. What was his reputation uh, as a man of love? Well, he apparently visited prostitutes, but this was before he got married. So we'll give him tick for not being a cheater. So, but again, you know, obviously prostitution, very questionable morality among what people think. But so you can sort of add that as the interesting column. But with Mary, it was very initially happy, but she was very mentally unwell. Bless her. She had a... Historians say she might have had bipolar, but so you can't really diagnose it hundreds of years later. You know, he, she mentally and physically 
it's believed she did abuse her. Maybe not. Maybe it was because of her mental illness, but she wasn't well. They suffered a lot of tragedy to the point where he said, I'll put you in a mental institution if you don't shape up a bit. So while they did love each other and she, it was initially very happy, the relationship was very fraught. She had family fighting in the Confederacy. She nearly died in a carriage accident that was meant for him. So his personal life, especially during the Civil War, was a mess. You can't believe that somebody could go through all that and still sort of make out relatively okay. Really got yeah. shot, of course. It's amazing with Lincoln because it wasn't just the country was falling apart. His personal life was falling apart at the same time, and he still managed to come through all that it just it's one of the reasons that makes him great is all those personal issues. all right the man that is always in history going to be attached with lincoln to the hip ulysses s grant we talked about this when we talked about the first ladies a little bit but i think it's worth bringing up again grant had a reputation of being an alcoholic during the civil war lincoln famously quoted find out what what he drinks i'll send it to all my other generals at least he fights but um other historians i know shelby foot wrote about this especially he only drank when his wife wasn't around so if he's only drinking when his wife ain't around, obviously he must love his wife. And even though it's kind of a twisted, unhealthy way, how was that relationship? Well, you know, there's, they had family problems in that their respective families didn't like their choice of spouse. He was from a deeply religious abolitionist household. They were wealthy slaveholders. Her father didn't have a problem with you as a person, but he just thought, you know, definitely you're going to have a good life plus your family. But, you know, there's no evidence they were ever on was particularly unhappy obviously they were a part a lot due to his work which unfortunately comes to the territory of military especially when you're in a time where you can't really get into contact too easily but there's no indication they were ever particularly unhappy they seemed okay and like I said he didn't drink when his wife was around maybe it's because she told him off or maybe because he just missed her we'll sort of never know but pretty stable pretty good relationship she was a pretty cool woman so yeah no problems there yeah quite the socialite after the white house too had a lot of connections uh talking to sarah stoker on take a quick break when we come back we're going to move into the modern era a little bit <clears throat> excuse me when we come back we'll move into the modern era a little bit we'll do some quick hit stuff who was the most handsome presidents who's the ones with the best love life who were the downright creeps we've had a couple of them a couple of our modern presidents too have some interesting history to them sarah stook our presidential historian friend continues with us on her tell right after this now let me see you go off like a bomb Welcome back to Herd Tell. Uh, Sarah Stuck again joining us. Okay, we've talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly of some of our earlier presidents. We've had some downright creeps. Um, creeps, the only word for it. What was some of the ones that really stuck out to you of just like, egads, this person probably should have went to prison? Well, Grover Cleveland's apparent love child was apparently conceived by rape. Obviously, you know, it's never been proven. This was on the word of the woman who bought the child, though there was never any concrete evidence that it, it was his child. So, yeah, should have been in prison there. He just said I was doing it to protect my married friends and the other one's not married, so I'd take paternity. But if it's to really rape her, and he did marry a girl he'd raised since childhood. So, yeah, Grover Cleveland was very creepy. Uh, I also add to the list from the thread you did on Twitter about this, uh, Warren G. Harding, that dude had a couple screws loose when you started looking at his love life, didn't he? Historians, some believe that Florence, his wife, poisoned him as revenge for his affairs. And I'm not condoning that, but when you read about it, you can kind of see why people think that. She was a really incredible woman. If you read my last article on First Lady, she was 
absolutely amazing and she just thought of as the woman who probably killed her husband but yeah he he had sex in coat closets he had maximum of birds he had a baby out of wedlock which was proven with dna years later he was a scoundrel but it was kept quiet and he was super popular until he died and everyone realized what a horrible corrupt person he was both morally and as president and just to be clear, we're talking about the cloak closet in the White House, not just like a random one somewhere. And he also nicknamed his manhood, which we won't get into, but he's, that's just the kind of guy you're dealing with. Did the Secret Service really pick up the tab for his child support? Well, they took the child support to the woman. So whether or not they actually picked up the bill, but they did take it. They were the guy between. Unbelievable. Okay, uh, let's switch gears for a second. Who was very well behaved, maybe too well behaved, as some of our more modern presidents go? Who really towed the line and behaved themselves? I think when we sort of look back now recently, Obama, you know, there's no whiff of adultery or anything. He met his wife in his 30s, so obviously, you know, he, what, late 20s, early 30s. So, you know, he had girlfriends before, nothing improper. Seems very devoted to Michelle. They seem like a very great partnership. And I feel like she would rip into him if he did anything she seems like a very tough cookie good for her so obama um both bushes there are rumors of affairs i take with, with a pinch of salt but they both seem very devoted to their wives which i think you know that kind of old family values kind of like the adams i feel they probably had yeah two presidents who were very very well respected but both had affairs you just mentioned, but Bush the Elder had uh, a woman who was his aide that kind of, um, there's a lot of evidence now that he made sure she traveled with him at a lot of times. There's obviously an affair there. Now, he obviously loved his wife very much by the end, but there was an affair there. But Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, long running affair with the woman who was his aide and driver at one point. There's even some evidence that he wanted to get a divorce and the higher ups in the, in the military and the government just wouldn't allow him to do it. Kind of surprising, two folks that are very universally respected, but they had long-term affairs. Again, you know, you can get people who are very morally good, but have, you know, weaknesses, whether it be adultery or alcohol or drugs or anything like that. Um, Eisenhower was separated from his wife for very long. That's no excuse for adultery, but it gives him the option. And yeah, he was it's never been proven, but it's, you know, it's pretty another likely scenario that he was having an affair with Case Summers, who he was you know, a lot younger, very pretty, probably very exciting for him. And it rumors that he wanted to divorce mainly, but the higher ups in the military said that will kill your career. We will kill your career if you get a divorce. But, you know, a high ranking official divorcing his wife for a much younger woman. You could have affairs, but you couldn't divorce. That was sort of the red line there. So he sort of had to tow. But um, they seem to have quite a good relationship, him and Mamie. But still, you know, a military man away for a long time. You can kind of see that coming from a mile away. Yeah. Okay. The two that are on the top of the mountain of Randy presidents, and we had them back to back. Uh, Let's start with JFK. It is pretty legendary at this point. It was well hidden by a very helpful press who managed to not want to talk about it for some odd reason. I guess they didn't like money or attention or press uh jfk was just on a whole nother level when it came to being a womanizing president wasn't he well i had my jackie shirt on today funnily enough but because i feel deeply sorry for my very favorite first lady but he was like that from an early age his father encouraged his sons to be terrible to be with prostitutes to be with married women while his daughters were meant to be chaste and virtuous if you look at rose lobotomized probably because she likes to flirt which would probably be not acceptable for a young Kennedy lady but you know Kennedy he shared um, a mistress with his father Glory Swanson maybe Marlon Dietrich he had an affair with a Russian spy which got him into a weird piece of trouble he nearly um, dumped Jackie about a few days before the wedding because he met this Swedish woman he took a girl's virginity in his wife's bed in the White House his wife's in front um, was taking a tour guide around a reporter and her friend said that's the woman my husband's apparently been doing so she was definitely aware she did nearly divorce him apparently originally she was okay and she said well my father did it and she loved her father very much it's what men do but when she realized the extent 
Joe Kennedy had to say, I will pay you to not because that would have ruined, as a Catholic and as a senator, ruin his chances. But yeah, he was, you know, until the very end, he was very unrepentant. Their relationship did sort of go a bit better when their son Patrick died, but that was obviously a few months before he was assassinated. But yeah, he was, he likes women, let's just put it that way. He only got married because there was rumours he was gay. That was it. He Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have bothered. <laughs> what a world. All right, his replacement. Um, I've told people uh lately when we were going through the trump years and people were talking about oh trump's so vulgar i'm like no he he's a piker you need to read up on lbj i don't know that we've had a more vulgar man ever in the white house he was very proud about it he was not subtle about it he was loud he was in charge and he had a love life to match it didn't he well he nicknamed his appendage jumbo which was apparently deserved that's a good that's what that we say the better and um, he had a long affair with um, another senator with his secretary his wife probably knew he did love his wife but he was pretty emotionally cruel so we're talk, calling her fat and ugly even though she bankrolled his campaign so grateful there but yeah he had no comments about nudity about telling people when he was on the toilet yeah i'm ringing you from the toilet he was just yeah very vulgar brash typical texan so while JFK was sort of a smooth New England adulterer, LBJ was proud. <laughs> um, coming to the modern era to put a bow on this with our friend Sarah Stoke real quick. Uh, it's unavoidable to talk about, but the most recent uh, scandalous of the presidents, uh, William Jefferson Clinton. Uh, we talked about the cloak room in Harding. We all, we all know about Monica and the Oval Office. I lived through it the first time. I really don't want to talk about it again. But... Uh, Slick Willie, we called him that for a reason. Long list of not only affairs, but other uh, accusations of mistreatment of women as well. If that, if he's in the social media age, does it, any of these guys, you could say this, but especially Clinton, how much did he luck out that the internet was just right after his presidency and not before? Well, it was the Drudge Report that broke the story. I think it was the Washington Post, I believe, that alone and Matt yes, Drudge broke up on, on the internet as the internet was coming into its yep. infancy. So he was lucky it wasn't more developed. Let's just say that, you know, nowadays, you know, back then you had people like Gloria Stein and basically calling him Monica Lewinsky a slut and saying he was just trying to be friendly. But he had an affair with a woman young enough to be his daughter in the White House, which it's not illegal, but it's very morally questionable. He's her, he's the president, he's her boss. I'm not saying she was completely innocent. She was a willing party, as it were. But, yeah, it's very morally questionable. Well, he had fled to have affairs and rape allegations, which is obviously even worse. I think nowadays people are picking up on it and people are starting to sort of question his legacy. He's a very popular president. He still remains because he was over a pretty, you know, good age of politics. So, yeah, and Hillary stuck by him. Obviously, I think she was in a, as much as I despise her, it's a catch-22. She leaves him. It makes her look like she's quitting and she stays with him. The feminists are angry. So, yeah, she had no real choice in that. And Chelsea Clinton was as much a victim of any of it. She's only yeah. a teenager. But, yeah, he, they say he's very charismatic. I don't think he's particularly attractive, but he's very charismatic. And I think that's how he did it. No, he was. I met him several times because I was stationed at Little Rock when he was leaving the White House and we had to move all that stuff. And he was kind of guy you wanted to shake his hand and then you made sure you check, make sure you still had your watch after shaking his hand. That was the kind of feller he was. Um, I don't know. I think if Hillary leaves him and makes a big feminist moment of it, she not only would have been president, probably has a statue on the National Mall by now, but we'll we'll never know now. Uh, one last one. We have to deal with it. Um, Donald Trump, who was ever bit the problematic that Bill Clinton was, he did deal with it in social media. Nobody cared, or at least his voters didn't. Uh, what about our 45th president who has a long, detailed, not well hidden because he was pretty proud of it. He put the cover of the tabloids in his office framed up long history of love, interests and other assorted things. Yeah, I mean, he would LBJ would make him look like a quiet boy. He's not probably as bad as the initial ones were, but he, you know, he did cheat on his wife when he was pregnant, which is just not OK. He cheated on his first wife with Marla Maples. It's a bit of a a cycle with him obviously there are allegations you know the um the tape that came out a few weeks before the election didn't help but it's interesting because you know 
a lot of his supporters are evangelical who would usually, you know, they rightly scoured Bill Clinton for what he did, but they seem to give Trump a pass, maybe because he's you now a bit more pro-life, though I personally think he probably actually doesn't really care about abortion either way. He's, I mean, but he's not particularly conservative in the way that, you know, Mitt Romney or any of those lot. I mean, Mitt Romney, for all his faults, is a very, very loving and good husband. You can't get much better than how he treats his wife. But yeah, Donald Trump's an interesting one. But you kind of expect it from him. And he's, he's the type you think, well, of course, the course he's had a first. It's, it's Donald Trump. It's not really a surprise, like, say, Eisenhower, FDR were. Yeah, I think it's just baked into his brand. But when you're a celebrity, he gets the celebrity rub or the celebrity overshines things other people don't get away with. Sarah Stuck, I love doing these little tidbits with you. Uh, I'm going to openly lobby since somebody lobbied you into doing this one. We need to do one about the drinking habits of presidents, which I think would be uh, somewhat interesting. We've had a couple of teetotalers. Trump, of all his other faults, you can't get him for that one. He doesn't drink. Well, yeah, his, his brother died of alcoholism. Yeah, and it must so have really hurt him. Maybe, so, you know. Maybe do a list of presidents who didn't didn't have problems because we've also had some admitted fall down drunks. Uh, George W. Bush was an admitted alcoholic until he got religion, cleaned himself up. We talked about Grant already. That might be a fun one. And then we can talk about, you know, uh, prohibition in the White House and the lemonade pot and all that fun stuff. All the presidential advice is like yeah. JFK being high as a kite during Cuban Missile Crisis, which is very worrying. Yeah. Um, personally, the way some of our presidents behave, I wish a couple of them would smoke a joint once in a while, but that's just my opinion. Sarah Stuck, let folks know where they can find you. You've got a great series on uh, the First Ladies. You're up to the modern era First Ladies now at elections-daily.com. Let folks know where they can find your writing and your social media. Uh, so Elections Daily, obviously, the next piece will go from um, Beth Truman to Pat Nixon, then Betty Ford to Hillary, and then the remaining ones, there's about three left. Um, Mallards UK did a series on royal mistresses, which is quite fun. I'll be writing about that soon. Um, yeah, so you can find me on that. Yeah, speaking of which, saw Charles do the Queen's speech, so I'm sure he'll be on that list somewhere with Camilla Parker Bowles. Uh, Sarah Stook, you do great work. We love having you on here. A little bit of history to take a break from the politics of the day. We're going to keep having you back. Talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Back to her tell quick note a friend of the program been a guest on the program uh kayla young delegate kayla young in west virginia uh as we've covered west virginia not only redistrict their congressional district that we talked about yesterday every single house seat and the senate seats all got redone they redid how they do the entire house of delegates which means everybody got redistricted basically including our friend kayla young she won her primary handily a 70 30 type victory I increased her vote totals from what she even thought she would. She put out a statement on Twitter thanking everybody for the show of support. She'll be lined up against uh, another sitting delegate because of redistricting, uh, Larry Pack, who got a few less votes than she did in his primary. It's going to be a tough re-election fight for both of them. We'll keep you updated on it. Hopefully have Kayla back on the program soon. But wanted to update you there. Well done to her. Her story is a great one, although we disagree on a lot of political things. I love stories like her during the COVID thing. She was trying to run a couple of small businesses, including a food truck, got shut down by COVID, found herself unemployed. So she ran for the House of Delegates and she won, did it the old fashioned way, knocking on doors, walking her district. Now she's in a new district trying to run for reelection. We'll keep you updated. Good on you, Kayla Young. Good luck in the general election. More Herd Tell coming up next.
Hi, welcome back to Hertel. We always end on a little bit of a lighter note. Some good news, usually something involving charity work, things like this. We got to cover a lot of heavy topics. So let's go to the NFL. Uh, first round pick, Kayvon Thibodeau. Uh, this is from ESPN. We'll be wearing the number five with the New York Giants who drafted him a few weeks ago. The same number he wore as a unanimous All-American before being the fifth overall selection out of the University of Oregon last month. The problem? Veteran kicker Graham Gano already had that number. So in the NFL tradition, he had to cough up for it to the tune of 50 grand. Uh, it cost him 50 grand to get it from the veteran kicker. The positive for Thibodeau is his money will all be going to charity. The two agreed on donating it to Puppies Behind Bars, which provides service dogs to wounded war veterans and first responders, in addition to explosive detection canines to law enforcement. Gano comes from a military family. His dad served in the Navy for 30 years. I feel like it's where the money that Kayvon was donating would be able to make the largest impact and help the most people throughout him giving that money. He told the Giants website, the whole idea behind the number five being special to myself and being special to Kayvon will be able to help five people get five dogs and be able to make an impact in five people's lives for the better. Again, it's jersey number five that they're arguing over. Uh, this is the whole goal behind that, and I'm really excited about it. Thibodeau joked at his introductory news conference that it would take a lot of zeros to get the number from Gano. After all, the former Giants safety Jabril Peppers was unable to pry it away from him previously, who says he wears that number because he has five kids who range from 10 to 2 years old. It's funny. You guys just know this is real now. We're talking real numbers, he said with a laugh. When you tell somebody 250, I don't know what 250 means. You forget all the zeros behind it. Things are a lot different now. But, yeah, he's a great guy, and we obviously are going to build a good relationship. And I'm really excited to get to work with football to talk to him about it, and the money's going to charity. Cool story. It's a cool tradition in the NFL. The veterans get the numbers. Doesn't matter how good the new guy is. He's got to pay up, show the respect, and a very, very worthy cause. Uh, working dogs, guide dogs, and explosive finding dogs are invaluable to many people. That'll do it for Hertel. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. If you're on the podcast, if you're watching on the YouTube page, make sure you subscribe. That way you don't miss a single thing we do. Heard tell every weekday, the good talk interview segments every afternoon, twice on Sunday recap show, the deep dive podcast. There's 36 of them. Make sure you go through and watch and listen every single one of them. And you won't miss anything coming up. Got some good stuff planned. Promise. And it's all because of you folks. Uh, you supported us. And we thank you so very, very much. So until we see you again, wherever you and yours are, across the street or around the world, we hope you are well. We hope you are well fed. And we'll talk to you tomorrow for more Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.